This is An Ordinary Pastor's Wife with Kimberly Black. My name's Ernie. I was uh, raised in Los Angeles, California by both of my parents. Hi, I'm Drew. I was born in Ridgecrest some 40 years ago. Hi, my name is Steve, and I was born at Kaiser Hospital in Fontana. I had the pleasure of growing up with an older brother and an older sister. I uh, grew up the first six years of my life in Riverside and then moved to Colton, uh, California, where I spent the rest of my teen years. Unfortunately, my parents divorced when I was 21 years old while I was in the military. Uh, I have a sister that's three years older than I am and um, raised by my mom and dad. Uh, they split when I was 14. I had the uh, privilege of growing up in a house with uh, mom and dad. They were married for 38 years before my dad passed away in 2003. I was first married when I was in the military and I had uh, two daughters at that time. And now I'm remarried to my wonderful wife, Allison. And uh, we have one daughter and a boy finally on his way. Jamie and I were married in 1996. We were married for seven years before we had our, our first boy, Joshua, uh, who is now nine. And Joshua uh, took us seven years to conceive him. And uh, since then, we've had the honor of adopting baby Frankie uh, just a couple of months ago. And we have Cassidy, um, who is our foster daughter. So I get the privilege of being dad to three now. Everybody that is a grandparent told me that the coolest thing in the world was being a grandfather. And I thought, well, I love my kids so much. How much better could it be? Oh, can't even begin to tell you. Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Father's Day to all of our dads out there. We have something special today. I've been excited about today and hearing from these gentlemen that are here. We have three of our dads. We have Steve, Drew, and Ernie. So if you can welcome them to the stage, we're so happy that you're here. We are going to be talking today about relying on God as, our, as their compass and how they've included that in their work, their kids' lives, their career, and their marriage as well as their personal life. That can be a lot to juggle. And so we appreciate you being here. And I wanted to kind of set the stage. We are kind of talking about the compass. And I know the compass has been around since 2006 BC and has been used to help orient people. And I know for me, I don't know, is there anybody else here that's a little directionally challenged? <laughs> Okay, there's two of you. Well, <laughs> thank you for being honest. I know my husband, typically, I do tend to get lost quite a bit, and he will um, typically try to teach me in those lost moments how to read the map or use it, and it's not very effective. Um, <laughs> he's, he, and that's because of me. He's actually told me, if you're thinking that you should go right, just go left. If you think you, just pick the opposite way. So um, that seems to be working, but... Uh, we actually have a compass for every man here today that as you're leaving, you'll be able to get one of those just as a symbol to remind you of what we're talking about today and keeping our lives focused. So his word is what keeps us on the right path, and that's the compass that we, we use during difficult situations. And we know that men have a huge responsibility and, um, when it comes to leading their families, and sometimes that pressure can be more than we even realize. So it's very important to not try to do that on our own, and we want to have that compass, which is Christ and using his word to, you know, help lead these important people, the grandkids and the kids that we're leading. So along with the pressures and seriousness of being a dad, there are some notions that some dads, I know it's not everybody, so I'm not generalizing that, but sometimes they may not be the most attentive with things that maybe the mom would be attentive with. So, um, you know, like losing the kid at the mall or forgetting them at church or um, forgetting to pick them up from school, those kind of things, diaper incidents, we've heard of all those. I know one day on the way home from work when our daughter was pretty young, um, I had, well, I was actually on my way home, and he had called me and said, I need to tell you something. Well, first he said, Kimberly, which that was scary, and he said, I need to tell you something, and before you get here to prepare you, something that happened earlier in the day, so he waited till later, <laughs> and he said that he had fallen asleep for two minutes, and that he woke up, and he had this blonde curled hair all over, and um, so he was telling me that she cut her hair. Well, I was, you know, dramatic, like my life had been ruined and crying already, hadn't even seen it. And um, it was just horrible. I was really upset with him. Well, I got home and I look and literally she had cut down to the scalp 
I mean, there was, there was nothing of the long curls. And so I told him, this is not a two minute job. I know that you had to be <laughs> asleep longer than the two minutes. And then Janelle just looked at me and said, I think I look good, mom. So, <laughs> so it was just like the worst day ever. But so I know that we have some funny moments and we'd like to hear from the three of you as far as some funny memorable moments that you have. And we'll start with Steve. What can you share with us about Hannah and Spencer and maybe some baby powder? Um, well, <laughs> first off, my son Spencer was, was a pretty timid kid. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hannah was just as bold as she could possibly be, and she's a couple years older. And um, I just always have these memories of hearing a bunch of clatter down the hallway, and she would come running down the hall, and like four steps behind her would be Spence with that look on his face. And uh, they were just so close together. But one of the, I wasn't there. It was uh, uh, something that Helene saw. And uh, we had a picture, we couldn't find it, but uh, she came out into the living room one, one day, she'd been doing something, and uh, probably two, two minutes, I think she was gone two minutes. She came out and um, they had found a, uh, a squeezy of baby powder. And uh, she came out and they were literally covered, for, and you can see how dark they are. They were literally covered <laughs> from head to foot with powder and all you could see was their eyes. And there's this fantastic picture of them looking up at her like, look what we did. And they're just <laughs> all the carpet all around and all covered with baby powder. That's funny, thank you. That's really hard to get baby powder off as well. Um, and then Drew, I think you have something to share about an allergy that maybe Joshua had. So I don't know if this is gonna be Funny or disgusting. Oh. Josh was about nine months, ten months old, and uh, he was standing, holding on to the television set, and I was eating some nuts there on the on the sofa. And uh, so he was over there, standing there, and he kind of spit up a little bit. So you know, I went over and I kind of wiped his face a little bit, you know, and then uh, pretty pretty soon, kind of threw up again. And I was like, oh, what's wrong? So I go over and I I pick him up and I hold him up. And I said, Joshua, honey, what, what's wrong? Projectile vomit right into my mouth. And I swallowed it, folks. Oh. So I put him on the shoulder and I'm running up the stairs. And then he, he just continues to throw up as I run up the stairs. And yeah. How so. are you not throwing up? Yeah. And here's the deal is I'm, I'm a thrower upper. So <laughs> like... <laughs> but okay, it didn't happen. Something. I made it, didn't I? I made yeah, it. Yeah. That's something you don't forget. So, Ernie, you also had a serious surprise by one of your daughters, maybe around the age eight, Jordan, if you wanted to explain with us. Yeah, so, uh, so I met my wife, Allison, um, through eHarmony. And so we had a uh, long-distance relationship going on. And so about two months into our um, relationship, we finally decided, hey, we're going to go ahead and... Um, probably right here. We're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and you know have the kids meet Allie. So we spent the day um, together, and we went to the beach. Everything was fine. The very next day, we were gonna go ahead and uh, go pick her up again to go out and with you know with my sister too, so she can also hang out and spend some time with her. So uh, as I'm saying, okay, all right, girls, let's go. Let's get ready. We're gonna go pick up Allison. Um, my daughter comes out with this, and it's basically a marriage contract um and she's only met her for a day <laughs> you know <laughs> and so i'm like oh wow okay and so at the very bottom it says pending approval of my sister because obviously <laughs> it's very early so we go and head over to uh Allie's house and uh the first thing jordan does is immediately run over to her and says ally you need to sign this <laughs> And I was like, okay, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> well, Luckily, she said yeah. yes. <laughs> it worked out. It awesome. worked out well. <laughs> Kids are sometimes more observant than we are, I think. Mm -hmm. so. But each of us come from different backgrounds and different stages of life that we're in currently with our kids. And our faith in Christ, I'm sure, has had a big 
impact as well as how we've learn to raise our kids from that's been modeled to us and navigating through difficult situations with our families. So we're going to dive into that with the guys. They're going to give us some personal information about what's been going on with them. And Ernie, I know that um, your parents were immigrants, as you mentioned, from Guatemala, and they eventually ended up divorcing. And your dad was in the military who abused alcohol and drugs, and he was very, very strict with you. Um, I'm sure that that had a huge impact on how you decided to raise your children today. And you've also been divorced and become single through divorce with two kids under the age of two at one point. That's a nightmare in itself. And in light of how you were raised and you want to raise your kids, how do you balance having that shared custody with somebody else and choosing to do things the way that you would like to do them? Yeah, so as you mentioned about my dad, um, like I said, there was a history of al alcoholism in my family. Um, like my dad's now clean, you know, over 25 plus years or so, he told me. Um, and yeah, he was extremely strict with me. Um, you know, I think he even apologized to me as an adult, you know, as in, I apologized for beating you, really, you know. And uh, I was raised very differently from my brother and sister because we, we have a big age gap, seven, seven years between myself and my sister and nine years between myself and um, my brother. And so... Um, the one thing, although although I seen him get drunk, um, I didn't know the difference. I just thought he was drunk all the time. I didn't know about the drug situation. It wasn't like an open thing, you know. Um, so I didn't know. But apparently, when I was 12 years old, he admitted himself to a rehab center, and so um, I, I do remember going through through that situation. But uh, the one thing. Although he did these things, the one thing he always said to me was learn to positive from others and apply it to your life. And he would say this constantly over and over again in Spanish. And so um, and that just stuck with me. And like I said, seeing his life, um, I, I chose to do the opposite. So for that reason, I've never smoked. I never did drugs. And I, you can pretty much say I don't drink. I probably had 10 drinks ever, you know, total of my life. Um, because I saw all that neg negativity, you know. Um, but yeah, but thankfully he still had a mindset of like, don't do as I do. Um, and then the shared custody, uh, it's hard. It's hard, you know? <sighs> it's, 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 it started very difficult. Um, but now we're at a point where it's very cordial. We do, um. We actually communicate via group messages a lot. So between myself, my wife, and my ex-wife, um, we pretty much communicate via that way. We have very open um, you know, communication lines. And so we, we, we all try to do our best to raise godly women. And meaning that using your faith as far as you know, coming to church and opening your Bible and praying about things, is that kind of, because that probably wasn't modeled to you necessarily when you were younger. What made you decide to do that? Yeah, like I said, although I didn't have the... I would say I had wonderful parents, but not Christian godly parents, but um, they did send me to a Christian school my entire mm -hmm. life, all three of my brother and sister and I. For that reason, they never owned a home. You know, they put mm -hmm. all their money into our, our education, into a private school. Um, and so that's where my background comes from. I've learned that, and I wanted to instill that into my daughter. So... Mm -hmm. You know, right now, they're serving. Um, it's, it was just in me to raise them properly to do the opposite of what I didn't get. So the most positive way I can do is obviously using God, you know, as, as my leader. So that's where I use a lot of my, um, that's my backbone. You know, that's, that's my backbone. That's how I, I want to raise them. And uh, I, I just hope that they continue so you've literally, you made the decision to basically change your generation by adding Christ into how you do everything. So that's Correct. really, really great. Thank mm -hmm. you for sharing that. And then Steve, we're going to move on to you. I know you've mentioned that you've had, you had some difficulties being a dad when the kids were younger. You're obviously a different person now. And so you have your one grandchild, Hudson, which congratulations, I definitely want one. Not right now, but... Um, <laughs> Can't wait. I heard it's really great. Um, and 
Steve, I know that you have changed as a father when your kids were at home, but can you describe what happened and how your approach may be different, what was going on then and how your approach may be different now with Hudson, your grandson? Um, just to kind of lay some foundation, I, I um, made a commitment to the Lord as a young man, very young, and um, but I didn't walk for most of that time, and so I really have to tip my hat to my wife. She's the one that um, kept that in our home, and um, you know kept me in a place where yeah I knew I knew that was the truth. I knew that was right, and and um, so I just wanted to say that it's mm-hmm. just really my wife that made that happen. Um, yeah, I had a hard time with little mm-hmm. kids, and I knew that going in, and, um, you know, even, even to this day, I still have kind of a hard time with little kids. Um, I think the difference now, <laughs> well, obviously, with a grandchild, here, here's the big difference. <laughs> That's the big difference. You don't have to deal with all of that <laughs> stuff. Um, but, but the impact, not 23,000 times, but um, I think the big difference now is that because my faith is, is so secure and both of my kids, you know, they, they um, trust in the Lord as well. Um, I, I think they, they look upon my faith as, as, um, as kind of an inspiration. I don't know how else to say it, but I think it really helps them. Uh, them along through all of this, and um, man, as far as being a grandfather goes, it's just, it's it's the most incredible thing, and I, um, you know, I see the Lord's light in my kids, and, and now my grandson, okay. I, I guess that's about it. Thank you for sharing, you know, that can be difficult. And then, Drew, we'll move to you. Um, we talked about how you had seven years that you and your wife experienced um, unable to have a child and the impact that that may have had on your family. And then you actually ended up fostering and then ultimately adopting, which congratulations on that. I know that happened recently. And I'm sure that both of you may have questioned God from time to time. And you know that may not have been how you knew that you should you maybe feel guilty sometimes about doing that. And so maybe please, because the, the hurt can be so deep sometimes that I think, I know we have some people here that could probably relate to that and describe some of the triggers that maybe could create that to be even worse. You know, maybe I know you mentioned going to baby showers or, you know, other people announcing pregnancies and how your faith help you to, helped you to keep things in order for that. So, um, first of all, I have to correct the record We were married for 10 years, almost 11, before Joshua came. So the record is now correct. (laughs) Good job. (laughs) Officially. Uh, So uh, Jamie and I uh, got married in 1996. We were married for a few years. We decided we wanted to have a baby. So we went down that road and nothing and nothing and nothing. Um, We saw, I don't know, like two or three doctors locally. Nothing came of it. Uh, We ended up hiring a doctor in Westlake Village, and we spent the next five or six years uh, in all kinds of different treatments. Um, In the seventh year, um, we ended up going with in vitro, and uh, so that requires a lot. First of all, it's expensive, but it's you know, it's bed rest. We, we live 150, 160 miles away from, from the doctor's office where the procedure is performed. And so you, you got to go down and you got you to gotta stay in bed for a week. Uh, and then you, then you get in the car and you, and you drive home. And, and it seems like the timing is such that you're always like on the road in the middle of the desert when the doctor's office calls to give you the, the news. So I can tell you, you know, many, many times uh, you pull over and, you know, sit there as, as the call's coming in. We both know. We kind of cringe, you know, and just kind of pull over and just wait uh, to hear that the cycle has failed. Um, and then, uh, you know, and then, you know, continue on and wait a couple of months before you can kind of build up the strength again. 
And uh, I can tell you, you know, many, many times, well, of course, there was a lot of prayer involved in that. Um, but many, many times we would, um, I, well, I, I don't know if you did. I should not speak for you. But I questioned, should I be doing this? Maybe I should just be adopting, you know? Should I, is this, maybe God's not meant for me to, you know, maybe it's not in his will for me to have my own, my own child. So, uh, big, big struggle. Uh, and then um, we ended up getting pregnant and having a miscarriage. And then we ended up getting pregnant a second time with twins. We actually had two heartbeats. And then we ended up losing them too. Um, so the, the triggers that Kim talks about is, you know, as we're kind of navigating through all of that and trying to find our way. Uh, we can remember, first of all, Mother's Day was not a thing in our, in our house. Um, so what we did is we had a little uh, timeshare in Newport Beach, and so we would take uh, Jamie's mom and my mom. Uh, every Mother's Day, we would go and spend a week on the beach. There was no going to church. There was none of that. Uh, where, you know, that would be. And then uh, every time uh, one of our friends would get pregnant, um, it was, you know, kind of a rough, kind of a rough deal. Um, but, uh, at any rate, we were, uh, finally got pregnant, uh, in May of 2006, uh, and, uh, we were at the, um, at the doctor's office, Dr. Miller's office, getting an ultrasound done, and Dr. Miller looked at me and he says, well, it's a girl, and I said, nope. <laughs> You're wrong, doc. <laughs> and he says, no, true. look, look, it's right here. It's, like, it's a girl. And I said, no, no, God told me I'm having a boy, and it's a boy. I, I knew. Um, and it was, was weird. Through that pregnancy, we, every day was a, is today the day that something's going to happen? Something's going to go wrong, right? And uh, at, the, at the end, matter of fact, we got a Doppler so we could every day hear the heartbeat before we went to bed, mm -hmm. just to know that we had that peace. Um, but... Uh, and then, uh, sure enough, a couple months later, we got the, the 3D ultrasound, and it was a boy, <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> so uh, I, was, I was steadfast in that. And then as that relates to adoption, uh, God, you know, placed it on my heart. I remember even as a teenager that I was going to adopt children. So um, I, I, you know... During the pregnancy of Joshua, it was like, you know, like I say, every day was, is today going to be the day? Mm -hmm. The opposite with baby Frankie. Uh, that was like the moment that I saw him, I said, yeah, you're ours. God's given you to, to, to us. So uh, that was a, the same way that I knew that Joshua was a, was a boy, was the same way that I knew that, that, that baby Frankie was going to be ours. It was just that. God had placed that, so. That's amazing. A lot of things that going through. So thank you for sharing that. I know it's not easy to find people that are willing to sometimes speak publicly about their challenges and struggles, um, let alone sometimes men can sometimes want to keep that to themselves. And then you throw in that we're at church, you know, we're all going around acting perfect in here every week. So um, that can also make it a challenge. And trying to find people that are willing to share that. I know, you know, we're not perfect. We, you know, we, none of us are. We don't have perfect upbringings. We don't have perfect families. We don't have perfect marriages. And our lives just are not perfect. So, and that's not what's expected here at church. So we didn't want to provide, we didn't want to portray that, that life is all flowers and rainbows. And um, because many of the things that we deal with are tough and they're difficult. They're painful. They can create a sense of loss sometimes are feeling lost from where you are. We wanted to provide real life situations that we know many of you have touched your lives as well. So sometimes we look around and we can you know, see everybody, maybe even sit in the same spot every Sunday and you see the person next to you and you think you know, they have it all together and it's perfect and everything. But you know, really to take that time and ask them how it's going or to check, sometimes we can be a support to others that we don't really allow ourselves, give ourselves time because we think you know, people are so much have it so much easier than us. I know Todd and I have talked many times about how just for people to get here into the service sometimes could be, I mean, they're on survival mode. You know, they're sitting next to you and they literally, it took everything for them to get 
themselves here or to even drop their, you, know, you see single moms sometimes or single dads dropping off at the kids at the nursery and they're just like, here you go, you know, and they just need to get in here and hear. They may not even be able to sing. They may not be able to pray. I mean, maybe not even listening, but they're here and they're wanting to hear from God and they're wanting a change in their lives. So when you look around, I think it's really important to know, I mean, these guys look pretty normal. So, you know, all of us have these situations that we're not perfect and trying to relate, we can be that church that people need. So going that extra mile to really find out how people are doing, I think, is important. Um, our last question, two, three. We would like the dads, we wanted to have you guys provide kind of a takeaway or some kind of advice that's based on your own experiences. And Ernie, we certainly know there are dads here today who may have found themselves through divorce, single through divorce and in a blended family. And what advice would you give the father who feels lost because their lives have taken this unexpected twist that they weren't contemplating? Uh, okay, so um, main thing is uh, never quit. Have faith in God um, and then have hope because I can't even tell my story without losing it. The first time I went through a separation, um, my daughters were, they're 20 months apart. So they were um, under two years old. And I found myself being a single dad. Luckily, I'm the oldest of, at one point in time, my, my, great, my grandma had 65 great, or grandchildren in general. Oh, um, I'm one of the oldest of, her second marriage, I, th I would say halfway in between somewhere there. I don't know. I don't know. But uh, so I've had a lot of experience with kids. But so that helped me a lot, obviously. But um, yeah, being a single dad, two babies <laughs> was rough. No, no jokes aside. <laughs> um, we got back together. Thank you. <laughs> we got back together and lasted about four years or so, and that pretty much ended the marriage. And so I became a single dad again um, when they were around, I don't know, six years old. My oldest was about six years old. And uh, for, again, not, a, not an easy lifestyle, but unfortunately during the divorce, I went through a, an 11-month custody battle. <laughs> the hardest thing I had to do in my life. Because from day one, I was told you can't do it, to quit. It's not, not, not that it's worth it, but you just can't. The, the, the system is broken. No dad can get, can get custody. Um, you're lucky if you get half custody, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The first attorney I fired because that was his mentality. I spent all this money on him, and he never did anything for me. Um, I, I never gave up. I got another attorney, and it was bad because it was almost the same thing. But I never gave up. I never. I kept going. It got to the point where I didn't have a home. I only had clothes. What was given to me? Um, one of my best friends gave me a place to stay. So every single time I'm thrown, you don't have a place. Wow, I can't afford a place because you're taking all my money. I prayed. Something happens, I get my place. And then you can't have the girls because you don't even have a bed. I can't afford it, let alone to eat. How can I afford a bed? I prayed. And this is no joke. I prayed one night. The very next day, I get a call from, a from friends from, um, from church. And they said, hey, we just found out we're moving to North Carolina. And um, we're not going to take anything. We're just going to go on a leap of faith on their own. And so they came and they asked me, hey, um, do you want to look through our house and see what you need? Because I know you, I've heard you needed some, some things and stuff. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I pretty much got an entire household full of stuff, beds. You're talking about. You know, utensils, plates, na you name it. It was all handed to me almost on the very next day. I was like, oh, my goodness. <laughs> and like I said, Come on. 
11 months later, um, after many ugly battles, I, I get awarded. I would have got awarded more than joint custody, but all I asked was for joint custody because I never wanted their mother out of their picture. Um, and so I get that, and uh, best day of my life, <laughs> you know. And so, um, yeah, just like I said, never give up. Have faith as, you know, as a father. You guys know, a lot of you guys know, you can do just about anything a mother can do also. Um, a wife just jokes around me and tells me the only thing I can't do is breastfeed. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was definitely a very challenging time of my life. We hope you haven't tried that. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, thank you. It's so uh, awesome to hear how God shows up sometimes when you're just really wondering where he is sometimes in those moments. And it's awesome that, again, through the church, some people have called, and that's really great. Um, Steve, you've referred to yourself as not being the best father when you were younger, and you've obviously changed. We know we have men here today that may feel like they've even messed up as early as this morning on the way to church or, you know, last night or for over the long haul. And what words of wisdom can you give them to steer them to change that path that they're on currently and become the dad or grandparent that their families need? Um, well, obviously, first would be to um, double down on your commitment to the Lord. Don't let that get away, because that's where it comes from. Uh, second would be to trust your wife, uh, the mother of your children. Um, um, you know, even though I wasn't walking with the Lord, I grew up, I, my father was a Marine pilot. He was, you know, one of these kind of guys. And uh, I know he loved me, but he never really said it. And he never really demonstrated that. And um, even though I didn't have the patience that I needed to have with my kids, the one thing I knew that I wanted to do differently was that I wanted them to know that regardless how much I loved them. And... Um, you know, it's funny. I was thinking about it this morning. I was reading this morning the story of the prodigal. And the part that sticks out to me the most in the story of the prodigal is, you know, all, all, all the beautiful images that are put in there. But the most beautiful part to me is that when the father got there, he fell on his neck and he kissed him. So my advice is, Regardless of how your patience might be with your kids, regardless of how much you're able to give because of work or whatever, just hug them. Just love them. Just tell them you love them. That's all, that's all they really want. You know, and so I was, I was really able to do that. The absence of that from my dad, but the presence of that from my heavenly father mm -hmm. and I knew that that was the one thing I was going to do <laughs> without question regardless and to this day um, I'm Steve the hug guy <laughs> you know yeah, you that's <laughs> yeah you are and, um, so, so that would be it just tell your kids and tell them you love them every moment of every day thank you Steve and then Drew you have discussed the infertility issues you and your wife experienced, and what advice do you give those that are sitting out here that have had similar disappointments, and they're listening today, and they have that deep pain, and they don't really know how to navigate through that in their life or their marriage, or feeling that something may be wrong with them? How, what can you help them with? You know, it's um, as I was thinking about uh, about this, I was thinking, you know, back all those years ago, what what was going through my head. And, what was like what was happening I remember um, this sense of of irony like okay so why God would you put this deep desire in my heart to have kids and then not be able to have them mm -hmm. right and uh, for a little while I actually you know was thinking maybe this whole thing's a joke like this whole world thing like you know maybe I'm just a pawn and um, it was, you know, that was kind of a, a low spot. Um, 
And, uh, but now, to fast forward, uh, almost a decade later, and see that um, the greatest miracle, uh, and he was definitely present in that uh, hospital room that, that day, <laughs> And uh, Catherine and Marati was there with us, and we were just, um, you know, we had some, some worship music playing, and it was just such, such a, um, an absolute beautiful experience uh, when Josh was born. And then uh, to fast forward to uh, April the 8th when we got to finalize the adoption for Frankie. And um, it, it, it occurred to me, and it wasn't until then that it occurred to me that... Uh, if I had it my way and I was just able to have kids on my own, then maybe I would have forgotten about this little thing called adoption. Maybe I just would have, you know, gone on with my life and been content. And um, then we wouldn't have had the opportunity to, to save that child. So I guess this is the advice. Um, I heard this story, um, Jamie and I heard this story from Pastor Payton many years ago. Um, and it was... You know, it's like watching a parade through a fence hole. So all you can see is what's right here in front of you. You can't see what's going on. You can't see the whole parade. You can't see the whole thing. But God, God gets to look over the fence. God gets to see the whole parade. So he knows the end. So keep the faith. Hit your knees. Thank you. And please help me thank these fathers for coming up and being vulnerable. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thank you guys. So Genesis 18, 19 says that, For I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep... I guess I'll sit down. <laughs> to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is just and right, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he had promised him. So God has given us promises in his word, and I think sometimes when you're going through these situations, you're navigating through them, it's easy to forget the promise, or sometimes I think, I don't want to hear that, I don't want to know that, I just want to be upset, and I feel like I'm not getting what is, you know, owed me. So I'm sure that each of these fathers felt some, at some point in their lives felt a little lost in their role as a dad, and it's not something that comes really with a specific manual of situations. I mean, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what to do when something, somebody throws up in your mouth or, you know, whenever you, you know, all these, that's not all I'm going to remember from today, but um, <laughs> is that, thanks, Drew. But it's, you know, you don't know what to do sometimes when your teenager is doing things that you have taught them not to do. You don't know what to do when they're making choices. And so it can, you know, it can be difficult. And it's kind of like going on a beautiful hike and you're out in the wilderness and it's beautiful and then you realize which I would never do that alone, but which you realize that you don't know where you are. You know, you're looking around and you've gotten turned around. And so then you pull out that compass that you have and that you wouldn't have left home to go in the wilderness without. And then that's what kind of directs your path onto the right way to go, to get home. And we all have Christ and his word with us today that can be our compass and can be an example in fatherhood. And each of them, you heard through their stories that they were relying on Christ, maybe not doing exactly what you would picture as being the most spiritual things to do every moment, but as long as they knew where to go in the scriptures and what to do in their church, helping support them, I think those are the, the things to do. I know a lot of times men feel like they need to be the strong one, you know, they're the man, and so a lot of times they may not be vulnerable to tell those things, but even with Ernie, he must have told somebody that he was having these issues for the church to reach out, for this couple to reach out and, and come and tell him. They wouldn't know if he hadn't have at least spoken about it. So sometimes we tend to keep those to ourselves, but that yet we have all these people around that can help us align through that. So um, how do we realign our lives to be on the right pathway? Um, I know you've heard Pastor Todd mention many times, Coming to church is important. You know, getting fed, having that church family uh, is very, very important. You don't have to wait till you have it all together or perfect. I mean, if you spend, you know, well, probably not five minutes, but maybe we'd let you know in probably an hour. But, you know, some of the things that we deal with or if you come and ask us, we're going to let you know, you know, we're not perfect. And we don't expect anybody coming in here to be perfect. There isn't a specific model that has to come in and be in the church. We just want everybody to come in and know God's grace and be able to change lives is what we would like. So that's one thing. And then, of course, getting involved in a small group is important because
because with so many people around you, you're not going to tell everybody your story, but the people that you're with and you're, you're learning about Christ with and you're spending time with each week or each month, those are the people that can help navigate through some of these situations that sometimes you don't, you can't even think clearly. And so somebody can be saying, hey, we're praying for you, or what do you need today, or you know, what's going on. So that's really important with the small group. And then we also believe in serving in a ministry because that not only helps change the lives that you're you're in ministering to, but it also helps change your life. So that's so important. So that's just kind of what we wanted to do today. And we hope that if there's anybody in here that's coming in, you're in survival mode, you barely made it in, we're so happy that you're here, but we'd like to know what's going on. Don't hold that to yourself. You know, let somebody know so that we can help minister to you in that way and support you. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Can we thank Kimberly for facilitating today? Come on. You know, one of the things that um, is so indicative of typically of men, um, you think, well, men are just cold. They're, there's no emotion to them. I mean, we didn't pick these guys for emotion, but there's, there's obviously, <laughs> yeah. obviously under the surface, out of the hard exterior that uh, you see sometimes with men, uh, there, there's a heart, there's a passion, there's a love there. may not be demonstrated and may not be communicated uh, sometimes in the way that we want, but uh, I hope it's a reminder to you ladies that, um, you know, there's, there's God's working on the inside and, and there are feelings and emotions there that uh, just sometimes are not really expressed the way we w- would want them to. And as Kimberly mentioned, our desire is that uh, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, every different uh, facet from a person who may be 50-something and come into Christ, or maybe you've grown up with, as a Christian all along, uh, st- take that next step. What is your next step? What is the next step that you need to take? It's never too late to start over. It's never too late to, to recalibrate the compass, to get back on dead north, and to say, okay, God, here's, here's where I got off. I'm going to get back on track. And uh, God is just a God that uh, allows you to have grandkids and do-overs and to do things maybe a little bit differently to pour into their lives. And so thank you guys for sharing and we just appreciate uh, you doing a wonderful job uh, being vulnerable and being open. This has been An Ordinary Pastor's Wife with Kimberly Black. 